Good morning, Tennyson. Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. I will be reading from the NIV translation, and it goes like this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and my work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. They wanted again and were about noon, and about three in the morning, he did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning from the last one's hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These were hired less, working only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work with the for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired the last same as I gave you. Now, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money, or are you envious because I am so generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's one of Hawaii's most forbidden trails, yet it still attracts hikers who sneak in in the dark of night. These stairs were initially built as a means of reaching a naval radio antenna. The original wooden stairs were replaced by metal stairs in the 1950s. There are steps and railings the whole way, but there's also a steep drop if you miss step.
Good morning, everyone. I hope you have a great Memorial Day weekend. The Market Basket supermarket chain in Massachusetts had a CEO named Arthur T. Uh, Demolas, I think is how you pronounce it. He was a very wealthy man, uh, according to Bloomberg, worth about $675 million. He made a lot of money off of his stores, but he also reportedly treated his employees more fairly than almost any other chain in America. He paid a little more than other chains, and of course the workers were really grateful for that. But he treated them generously and decently with uh, scheduling, time off, healthcare benefits, and all those things. So by all accounts, he was loved by his employees. He also kept prices low because most of the stores were in pretty modest uh, income neighborhoods where high prices would be a stretch for a lot of the residents. But he made a lot of money. During his tenure of running the company, he also made a lot of money for the family and for stockholders. According to Forbes, they made an estimated $217 million in earnings on $4 billion in revenue in year 2013. However, he did not make enough money for his cousins and board members of the company. So in the summer of 2014, he was fired and immediately his cousin, Arthur S. Demolos, took over the company and started changing the profit sharing policies to give less to the local store managers and more to the absentee board members and stockholders. Well, the workers in the stores, of course, erupted in protest and almost overnight, so many people walked out that Market Basket was nearly done away with. And the stores that tried to hang on and remain open had few customers, in part mainly because they had no suppliers uh, and no one to stock the shelves, but also because the customers boycotted them. So then weeks later, after loud and, and extremely public wrangling and fighting, Arthur T. bought back the, the damaged company from his cousins and board members and all the workers and, and customers returned to the stores. Now it was a tough fight back. Do you know who Michael DeVire is? Well, he runs Kaiser Hoff restaurant in Montgomery, Texas. And in 2014, he learned that one of his employees, a 19 year old at that time waitress named Brittany Mathis was diagnosed with a brain tumor and could not afford her treatment. Well, when DeVire learned of Mathis's diagnosis, he went above and beyond what most bosses would do to help an employee in a kind of crisis like that. He put his business up for sale. Now he had listed his business before, but had turned down all the other offers. But this time, DeVire decided to auction off the restaurant with a minimum starting bid at half of the business actual value. Any amount over that, he said, would go to help Mathis with her medical expenses. Now, Ken Grinda was a guy that owned a bus company in Australia. And in 2012, he sold his 66-year-old family-run business for 400 million Australian dollars, about 305 US. And instead of keeping all the profits, he decided to take a, a share of that and give it to his employees. So he took about 15 million and used it to give out bonuses to all of his company's dedicated employees. Chuck Sibley was running Navistar. That's a diesel engine plant in Huntsville, Alabama when he learned that he was going to have to lay off a lot of his workers due to a production slowdown. Well, he was devastated and he cared about his employees and he worried about the welfare of his employees and all their families. People Magazine said he was determined to save his hardworking employees' jobs and he came up with a plan. He pitched it to a, a, a community outreach program to his managers and upper level people that would allow his workers to keep their jobs while helping others. His plan allowed to keep about 50 workers at full pay and benefits while they gave back to the community by doing special projects for charities. So those employees that he managed to save got to work with charities like Habitat for Humanity, Salvation Army, 
etc., doing work like building homes, sorting donations, repairing wheelchair ramps, and cleaning foreclosed properties, all while the company paid them. And then last, do you know who Darius Rucker is? Probably. We'll see his band a little later in the summer when we see a song by Hootie and the Blowfish. I learned about him when I saw him on the show Undercover Boss. It turns out he's one of the most generous people around. He recently picked up the tab for every single customer at an IHOP in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, a place he goes to often near his home. Nobody recognized him because he was wearing his mask. He also left a very large tip for all the staff that was working that day in a very packed IHOP. He plays fundraiser concerts for St. Jude. And as the undercover boss, he gave $25,000 to a young married couple so they could move to California and attend a music school. He hosts concerts to raise money for school supplies for his local community. And he gave a high dollar guitar to an up and coming young black musician that had talent. So in Matthew, when Jesus uses the word kingdom, in the Roman Empire, it was a dangerous thing to say. In the New Testament, the word is basileia. And in the Bible, it's used exclusively to refer to God or Christ's rule in the coming age. But outside of the church, the word meant that actual kingdom, that empire. And in the first century, that means Rome. So when we see the kingdom of heaven over and over in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is probably stirring things up pretty nicely, but he is also trying to make a point. The economy of God is not the same as the economy of humanity. We can see it way back near the beginning of the story. Deuteronomy 24, 14 and 15 says this, you shall not withhold the wages of poor and needy laborers, whether other Israelites or aliens who reside in your land or in one of your towns. You shall pay them their wages daily before sunset because they are poor and their livelihood depends on them. Otherwise, they might cry to the Lord against you and you would incur guilt. These laborers in the vineyard need work. They have to work. The day's pay that they were hoping for wasn't nearly enough for them to have enough. They couldn't set some aside every day but it was what they needed if they wanted to eat that day. But here's the thing. They are all in the same boat. They all have the same need, but the first group gets angry when the other groups get what they need also. And Jesus calls them out about it. One scholar I read this week said, most of the time, and especially in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus calls someone friend, it usually means they've done something wrong or said something they shouldn't have said. A guy named Bruce Molina and Richard Rohrbaugh are scholars on Luke and uh, on Matthew, sorry, and who help us see what's happening at the end of this parable. The words in verse 15 don't read the same in Greek as they do in English. Literally, they say, is your eye evil because I am good? In Jesus' day, it was understood that light comes out of the eyes. That is, we're able to see not because of the light coming into our eyes, but because of the light coming out of our eyes. It's what inside, it's what is inside us, what is in our hearts that enables us to see. We see by, by sending out what is inside us. Blindness was understood to be a heart problem. The evil eye is literally inner evil that is projected outward through the eyes. It was especially believed that envy, the, that covetous glance, was an outward projecting of evil desiring. And evil desiring always resulted in evil acquiring, taking what belonged to others. A great deal of alertness, charms, chants, and gestures were required to avoid being hit by an evil eye. The word used in verse 15 is ophthalmos, where we get the word ophthalmologist, the eye, the metaphor for the eyes of the mind or the faculty of knowing. The point here isn't 
necessarily that some people receive blessings from God that we don't. And it isn't that they get more or better or lovelier gifts from God. The problem is that they get the same as us and they don't deserve it, right? They're less worthy or, or later arrivals or just plain worse sinners. They don't deserve the same as we get, do they? Not nothing maybe, but certainly not the same. This parable is tough on modern day people because we all get the same gifts from God, but most of us don't act like it. This parable isn't about fair wages or proper reimbursement, and it isn't about economics or what to expect from a poor worker, but it is about the kingdom of heaven. This is a parable about a landowner who seeks out idle workers and gives them a purpose. This is a parable about God seeking lost people. The stairway to heaven is like this. A guy named Ira Brent Dean is the associate dean of academic programs at a seminary in South Carolina. And he said, and I'm quoting, the logic of the worker's complaint will be sure to surface anywhere God's grace disrupts our sense of just recompense. Like new church members taking leadership positions too quickly someone sulking over lack of sufficient recognition or failure um, to accept a repentant sinner, etc. And he is right. In my experience, church people everywhere are concerned about who gets in and who doesn't. Most of them are quite eager to tell you their opinions on the subject. But the irony is that God is offering the same gift of grace to every single person we encounter. Everyone. One of my uh, really great professors at SMU often asked us to imagine who we were in the stories of Jesus. Who are we in this story? Are we the latecomers? Are we the full day crowd? Who are you? But imagine a church that has figured out that all of us are just poor workers trying to make it through the day. Imagine a church like that. People will beat a path to that church. So let's be that church. Thanks be to God. Amen.